Facebook famously determined that if a new member invited 10 friends within 14 days, they were hooked for life. So they focused religiously on driving the user experience to this key metric. If you apply this product-based approach to B2B sales, then you can identify those users that are ready to talk. And this method is known as the Product Qualified Lead, or PQL. So if you sell in a freemium, open source, or trial model, then the PQL method is critical to give your sales team visibility into who is ready to talk. So talk to your data team, or better yet, partner with Whaler's team of data scientists to develop a PQL model tailored specifically for your business. You'll be empowered by knowing exactly when a user is ready to convert. To see specific examples, go to getwhaler.com forward slash Andy. That's G-E-T-W-H-A-L-R dot com forward slash Andy. And as a bonus, if you sign up to learn more about Whaler and PQLs, then Whaler will send you their optimized two-page master services contract that you can leverage for your own business free of charge. It's time to accelerate. Hi, this is Andy. Welcome to another edition of Frontline Friday with my regular and very special guest, Bridget Gleason. Now, before we get to the show, Bridget and I have a favor to ask of you. I'd really appreciate it. If you took time right now to leave a review for this show on iTunes, and while you're there, click the button, subscribe to Accelerate. Make sure you get Frontline Friday automatically each week. Also, we need to hear from you. More specifically, we need your sales questions. I mean, what can we answer for you? What challenges do you have that we can help you with? So go to accelerate.fm forward slash frontline and enter your question there. Each month, we're going to select one listener's question to be the question of the month. And the winner will receive a $50 Amazon gift card. So remember, go to accelerate.fm forward slash frontline to give us your question and maybe win 50 bucks. So Bridget, how are you today? I am fantastic. You yes. are fantastic. Great. I'm feeling fantastic. Life is good. Nice to talk to you. I always look forward to this, Andy, and just our discussions. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a, a focal point of, of my week. Yeah, it's fun. So um, today, on episode 99, by the way, of uh, Frontline Friday, oh, I know. is... Uh, it's almost two years. Think about that. Two years. Wow. Yeah. So as we're going to talk about empathy, mm. empathy. So this, this really got this thought, sorry, got stimulated by a quote I'd seen in a magazine and mm. it was quoting a woman named Meg Bear, who at that time was a group VP for Oracle. I think she's a startup advisor in, in the Valley these days. And it came from an article that was written a couple of years ago. But the quote is from her saying that empathy is the critical 21st century skill. Mm. And I was thinking, okay, well, it's yeah, hard to argue with that. Because as selling becomes increasingly automated and we're seeing this intrusion of artificial intelligence and natural language processing, machine learning, so on, the predictive analytics, da 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 that, that the ability to connect in an authentic fashion with another human is actually going to become, and research is showing, bearing this out, is going to become more highly valued skill on the part of employers and customers. So, so I really think it was like, okay, well, we seem to have sort of a shortage of empathy. <laughs> if we look around us these days, um, at least, you know, we even see our, you know, public discourse and so on. It's just, it's in our politics, it's, it's all a lack of empathy. You know, things that we see are wrong with it are in large part driven by that. Um, and so, you know, we just thought we'd delve into this because this is, in my mind, and I, the mind of many others, this is, this is, this is, per the quote from Meg Barrett, the empathy really is one of the real critical 21st century skills and increasingly so. Do you think, Andy, that it's a critical skill just in terms of dealing with prospects and customers, do you think it's a critical skill for managers? I think it's a critical life skill. I, do you I, think it gets? Do you think it's a critical skill that gets rewarded in business? Yes, not always, but yes. I mean, there are, are <laughs> I said, hugely unempathetic people that that uh, are quite successful, and you know we. <laughs> 
we can look at our political landscape and see many of them. Um, <laughs> we shouldn't go there. Oh, yeah, well, we can, but it's but it's it's the fact, right? I mean, we look at some of the policies that are being pushed, and it's it's like, okay, well, I understand that people have different political opinions, but the net impact of this is, you know, you know, if we took like the healthcare thing, you know, disenfranchise, you know, twenty million people from their life insurance or whatever, or health insurance, whatever it turned out to be, you have to think if that's the if that's the outcome of legislation, aren't the people who are pushing it sort of lacking in empathy for these people? So, so the reason the reason I ask the question is I I agree wholeheartedly that it's such a critical skill, and I'm thinking back to board members, CEOs, advisors when they're when they're coaching me. Mm-hmm. They're not talking about being more empathetic. Okay. And I don't, I have never seen a job description for a VP of sales right. that wanted me to be empathetic. That's not, and when, when I hear, I, I was uh, talking to a board member recently and he was um, talking about a, a VP of sales that he really, he'd worked with in the past and admired. And he's so great. And I, I know people who work for this person and He's a jerk. Yeah. That's what he is. He's a jerk. Right. So I, but see, I agree that it's a life. I, I agree that it's critical, but I don't see enough, Andy, of, of do we train salespeople how to be empathetic? Do we no, put it in no. job de- job descriptions? No. Do we? But how do you how do you sell without empathy? I mean, you can sell. It's like this VP you talked about there that was a jerk or is a jerk, and I certainly have worked with people that fit that same description. And yeah, what they are is they're brought in for a purpose. You know, I was at one company where they brought in this one guy to to run this one group, and everybody knew from the moment he was hired, they knew before he was hired, because anybody that knew this guy knew he was a jerk. And it, it ultimately cost him his job, but in the meantime, they wanted him to just come in and kick ass for six months. But 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 what you're saying then is contradictory. Like, if we really need that skill, and somebody can come in and be a jerk and exhibit probably well, my, the opposite. Well, my of point empathy. is my point is they're good for a specific purpose, right? You can can managers survive without empathy? Not on the long term. Yeah, they'll bring people in for my point is they'll bring somebody in for a specific purpose. And like this guy you talked about probably is, yeah, bring, we need to get the sales sales team going in the right direction. They come in and just kick ass. And maybe initially they motivate people for a month or more, but then they start chafing under the, you know, the person's lack of ability to identify what they're trying to, what they're going through as individuals. And that translates itself surely into the inability to coach and develop the employees because it's not about that for this person. It's all about the number. Well, and I think that uh, I don't think that uh, we're evolved enough that we hire for empathy. I think people hire for the number. They hire for the number. We need to hit the number. I don't, Andy. Yes. When when has it ever not been about the number as a VP of sales? I kid my the well, co-founders. It's, it's, but, it's, but if you're growing a company, it's about. It is about the number, but it's also about you have to grow an organization. You have to instill a culture, a winning culture. It's true. And, it's true. And the ability to develop people who want to be in that organization and succeed. And as a culture, that you're able to go out and interact with your customers in the way the customers feel that you're there to serve them and to help them accomplish their needs, it requires a degree of empathy. Yeah, and I just, I just don't know that most uh, founder CEOs, managers – I think they would agree, yes, 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 we need empathy. But when then they go and make the hiring decision, they well, sure. okay, they go after the ones that are the that at least on paper, this person's going to bring me bring me a number. And so I well, I, think I, 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 just, I think I told you the story is you know the the one question customers will never ask you, which is, you know, as a manager, they're never going to ask you is is, you know, can you make sure the salesperson that's <laughs> that's that's on my account is really salesy. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Your, your salesman is just not salesy enough. Please make somebody more salesy. They don't want that. 
right? I and know. and I so know. they really want. It's not that they don't want somebody dynamic, that they don't want somebody that's that's inspirational. But yeah, you know, part of the ability to be able to inspire people is is the ability to have some degree of empathy with their situation. I I think again that we can talk about this from a very academic standpoint and and I agree in the sale that the reps that do well individually I think do have do exhibit empathy. I guess I worry what the role models are for salespeople as they look up the chain. I don't see a lot of empathy. Well, I think that I, and I think that I think the Part of the situation, though, too, is is that organizations change as they grow and mature, and the culture has changed necessarily. Right? Is that yeah? I think you know, from a perspective you see of of primarily of you know early stage startups. Yeah, uh, you're right. It's probably probably a quality that's in relatively short demand, short supply. Excuse me. And do you think as a company gets bigger, you go to bigger companies? Do you think it it you see it more? I think those that are really yeah, focused on developing a culture that that is based on yeah. How do we how do we get our people to to grow and to mature to help us as an organization grow and mature and be able to take on more yeah you know, more a broader spectrum of work uh, you know broader spectrum of customers yeah I think that that I think the way you manage those organizations are different than the way you manage a startup. I disagree. Okay. Should we end now? Should we end? Okay, it's been a great session. No, I, I I disagree because I think that the culture gets embedded so early. And I will say one of the things that I love about the company I'm with is I think our, our co-founders um, are empathic. I think they have a lot of empathy and it's very unusual. So even at an early stage that they... It's 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 embedded in the culture. So I think this company will grow up sure. and continue. But I don't I don't I don't think it's common. So I guess I don't necessarily agree that well, okay, no, I don't, yeah, I don't know a startup a startup you start and it's okay to be uh, just go get the number. But then as you as you get bigger, then we can start focusing on empathy and these other skills. I I think it's either a value that is very deeply held and respected and it's a value, it's a core value or it's not. And if it's not, it's hard to inject it because if, if the founders don't and the people at the top don't really embrace it, I, I think there's going to be limited success in other pockets of the organization. Well, I agree, but my assumption is those leaders oftentimes change as well, right? So, no, that could be, yeah. But I think the issue is even more than empathy. I don't know, it's, though. It's really trust, right? If you're in an organization where there's no trust, then you're in an organization where there's no empathy. And so, to me, maybe trust is really, really more the the critical thing. And you, you know, you can't you can't develop trust without some degree of empathy. You know, I just had a conversation. And people will hear it on on the show uh, not too long in the distant future. An interview with Stephen M. R. Covey, who wrote the book *The Speed of Trust*, which is perhaps mm. one of the best books written on trust ever. And and you know that's that's you know one of the sort of the cores is you know you have to have to be able to develop this relational trust. There has to be a degree of empathy. But I, I think never. That, but I, think I, it's, I hadn't correlated the two. That, I think that's interesting. And I think that that. There's research, not that I think. I've seen the the summary of the research, and it's been written about that uh, in the same article in Fortune. The author, Jeffrey Colvin, talked about that that uh, there were researchers who analyzed 72 studies that mm. measured empathy in college students. And it's apparently been something they measure sort of like annually since 1979. Mm. And what they found is is that it's going down. You know, so it's going down. It's going down year after year. So it it's like, uh, yeah, as as the demand for empathy is is increasing, that the supply is actually shrinking. Why? Well, you know, there's there's lots of reasons people sort of project for that. I'm not sure that that I know what one 
you know, mm. there's one solid reason throughout, but but certainly, you know, I think it's probably increased. We can maybe say safely, I don't know, over the last two decades, as we become more sort of engaged with the screens in front of us, as opposed to with other mm. individuals, or mm. we engage with individuals, you know, solely through our screens, as opposed to how we might have done before, is that, you know, that's certainly part of it. I mean, you look at, you know, just the way the freedom people feel to uh, comment the way they do online, right? A lot of that behavior, mm. you know, is, is probably encouraged by the sort of virtual remote nature of the communications so who aren't actually, you know, it's not actually seeing the impact on other person. Yeah, I, th- I th- that's that's interesting. What? How do we? How do if if empathy is such an important skill? How do we? How do we help to cultivate it? How do we help to train for it? How do we help to just create environments that possess more empathy, reward empathy? How how do we do that? Well, I, I, it's a big issue. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's. Uh, People have written about this on a, on a on a broader scale about you know it's one of the real issues confronting us as a country is mm. that you know we look at our political divisions and we say well you know why are this group of people voting for that individual that makes no sense but as as this one author and I can't remember his name he's written a book about it um, by my reading reading a, a review of it basically saying is that it's because we've become less willing or capable of putting ourselves in the shoes of these other people and really understanding mm. their point of view. You know, that we take the sort of the easy way, the we easy way out. And I, so I think that that sort of pervades sort of everything we sort of do. I mean, there's a quote that I, I'd found recently from Michelle Norris, who is a you know, radio journalist, been a host on NPR, and I love the quote, and and I'll just read it here. It's a quote. Mm-hmm. She says, "If you want to conquer the world, you have to understand it." And the concern is that we are losing the ability to actively listen, and therefore to engage in deep and meaningful conversation. That is, we pull deeper inside ourselves with our headphones and personal devices and timelines mm-hmm. full of people we choose to like or follow. Mm-hmm. We put less of a premium on engagement with people we might not like or don't want to follow. And I think that's, you know, that sort of speaks to us. You know, we just, whether we're becoming more tribalized, but as a, sort of an outgrowth of that, you know, we're just not not making an effort to understand other people in the way that we might have done before. And so I think the challenge for, for people in sales is somewhat mirrored there in that, especially in, in you know, enterprise sales and so on with, uh, and increase the number of stakeholders that we have to deal with who are also increasingly diverse both in in their backgrounds and where they reside. I mean you could be working on a large account with you know nine people on the key stakeholders in the buying committee that could be dispersed around the world in you know different cultures and different you know different geographic locations. And you know if you can't identify with them individually instead of collectively as a group then you know, you're impeding your ability to really understand what they need and to help them come to a good decision and ultimately to win the business. Yeah, I, I was as you were talking, I was thinking about even as we're building a team here and we're, again, still a small company and, and uh, we've got a very tight team. The thing we also talk about is that while we're a tight team, we have to make sure that we are open to diversity and different types of people and different ways that they approach things that we don't, that we're able to look outside of ourselves. And it's sort of what you talk about to really try to understand how other people are thinking about it. Even on a sales team, I want diversity. I, and, but with diversity comes a requirement for empathy because this person doesn't think like we do. And just being able to really, I mean, we talk about it and I, I'm just thinking of other ways that are very practical, how you, how you hire for it and then how you just kind of embed it into the fabric of 
a team and a company and a culture. Well, I think that the equality that you know, Michelle Norris talked about that that is not stressed enough, mm-hmm. and it's given lip service, but it's not stressed. We don't we don't test for it when we interview people. Is you know, she said the ability to actively listen, and I I prefer a different phrase, which which borrow from my my friend Michael Bungay Stanier, who wrote the book The Coaching Habit. He says you need the ability to listen without judgment. And that's different than active listening. It is, but it's but I think that's sort of what she was referring to is but you know is to actively listen to you know put yourself in their shoes. But I think you know a better thought for people to keep in mind is that when you talk to people is how do I listen to this person without automatically judging what they're saying? Right? Without how do I how do I drop my filters mm. and not put my filters on what their experience is and what they're saying, but it's truly listen to what they're saying because this is, this is in my mind and I, the mind of many other people as well. This this is the critical skill. I mean, if if we're look forward to, you know, three to five years in the sales environment or maybe ten years, we're already beginning to see that that you know there are AI enabled bots and applications and so on that that can handle elements of what salespeople do. But, you know, the thing they don't have is they don't have, machines don't have emotions, right? That's, that's, that's going to be a long time coming. Um, and so, in that environment where there is increasing amount of automation, you know, your ability to connect with another individual, the customer, is increasingly, more so than even is today, is going to be the point of differentiation. And yeah, you know, how do you do that if you don't really just, like I said, eliminate your your filters and your biases when you're talking to somebody, but just listen to them without judgment, truly make an attempt to understand where they're coming from. So Andy, you you work with a lot of sales teams. Do you have a track on empathy? Are you going to talk about empathy in your new book without giving away too much? I mean, how do you how do you think about how do you think about just kind of weaving this into the work that you're doing. Well, the thing that we do now is we do focus on you know, on this listening part, right? Yeah, it's identifying identifying our filters and making a, a mindful, deliberate effort to set them aside. And yeah, you know, it requires and I think this thing that's this difficult for a lot of people in sales is is because they want to process and mm. through the process they want to have things sort of happen automatically, let's say. And, you know, when you're dealing with humans and human behavior, you know, it's a little more complex than that because people don't, you know, as much as when I say there's predictability about how people react to certain stimuluses, yeah, there might be some broad rules, but the fact is that that not everybody is that way, right? I and mean, we, can, we can take, you know, work like from, you know, Robert Cialdini about influence is a fantastic book, but you know, look at some mm-hmm. of the studies they did. We're still talking about, you know, not hundred percent of the people react this way to stimulus, but maybe a majority do. Okay, well, that means you can't treat everybody assuming that they're all gonna react one way. You have to treat people as if they're unique and their their reactions could be unique as well. And so it, it just requires uh it just requires a moment of thought. It doesn't require a lot of effort. And uh, Marshall Goldsmith in his book Triggers talks about this. You know, when you have, you've got a a trigger that might trigger a certain type of behavior, is is there is that moment. You know, in our human brains, we have the chance to to you know sort of evaluate the situation and decide what do we want to do. And I think you talked about this with the uh, OODA loop, right? Mm-hmm. And that's that's the same similar type thing. Yeah, you know, we have this. This is the power of what we are as humans. Is you know, we can take that moment and decide. Yeah, we want to not just react the way we always react, but we can react differently. And so, do you think it's 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 easy to develop empathy in people? I think that it's it's um, yeah, an easy sort of difficult word to work around. I think it's certainly doable, and I think. Covey talks about in the speed of trust is that you know this is a behavior that can be learned it can be learned faster than you think wow really yeah and it's I, but it's okay but it's, that's that's encouraging but it takes it it takes a mindfulness around it 
And it's, I've always said, and I said it in my first books, you know, sales is a game for thinking people, you know, because it's every action should be deliberate, not just reactive. And so it, it's, yeah, I think the people, those who succeed, I think we see the top performers. And one of the reasons it's so hard to take, you know, what a top performer does and say, look, everybody model what you do based on this is because a lot of what they do is based on, you know, is based on empathy and developing trust in ways that are are somewhat unique to them. Mm. Yeah, I would say that's true. I'm I'm encouraged to hear that it's something that can be developed. Yeah, well, I think Daniel uh, Goleman with his book Emotional Intelligence and and uh, yeah, other books have been written about uh, EQ, whether it's sales related, like Jeb Blunt's book or Colleen mm-hmm. Stanley's book on emotional intelligence for sales or emotional intelligence for sales success. Um, yeah, it's a it's, it's a muscle that can be developed, but it's what we have to do is we have to change, right? We have to reinvent ourselves, and I think that that this is sort of a hard thing with with people in general, but sales, I think, in particular, because because it is sort of you know part of this process, quote unquote process, you know, that that salespeople think they're they're in, is that you know you need to constantly be in this process of of reinventing who you are. And part of that is an awareness of of who you are, um, and there's various ways you can get that awareness. You know, just assessing yourself, or you know, actually having people assess you is you know doing your own 360 or you know, books that talk about how to do that. But um, yeah, you sort of have this challenge just to upgrade your your skill set in order to remain relevant. And if we are indeed heading into a world, which I believe is the case, where where there's actually greater value placed on these these interpersonal skills, mm-hmm. that those that don't develop them will be left behind. We'll be finding other other lines of work. Uh, those that have put an effort into developing them will find themselves more highly valued. And yeah, you know, but it requires change. It requires a commitment to change and constant change. So we get back to sort of themes we've talked about before right, about you know continuous learning. You know, it's not just about reading a book; it's about learning about yourself as well. And it's an important, yeah, it, it's important to have that as part of the curriculum. And I do think it's missed. I mean, you you talk about making sure that we, like active listening, and I like your phrase that it's this non-judgmental listening that I think is more likely to develop the empathy skill than just sort of what salespeople typically think of active listening. It may be a nuance, but I think it's a really important one. Well, right. It is. I think it is. But I, th- I think so. the bottom line you know, for the discussion is, is that we all have this imperative to change. Mm. You know, that, that we do sort of have a, a crisis of empathy. We see it, I said, we see it at all levels of our society. And it changes one person at a time. And whether it's in our work with the customers we're dealing with, whether it's our colleagues, whether it's mm. people online in our social networks, or you know somebody you follow on Twitter or Facebook, is is you have to develop a better understanding, put yourself in their shoes, because if we want to start making a dent in this, what I fear is sort of increasingly polarized society, we only do it by mm. making an effort to really really understand the other person and and but their ability to do that has benefits as I said not just on a personal level but on a, a business level as well. So hence this this imperative for change. Well I, I think it's I'm I'm glad that people are talking about it. I, I I think it is important and you and I've talked a lot about people buy from people and that connection and that trust is so important and it's only getting more important. So the more tools that we have, the more important this other sort of part of the equation becomes. Yeah. Well, I think, again, yeah, come together as buyer and seller, come together as, as in, mm-hmm. in, in society and your social groups and so on. Empathy is really the, the key to do that. It's going to require change on many of our parts to, to make that happen. But, yeah, to sort of close out with this, this quote from um, – Eric Shinseki, and Eric Shinseki had been a, a general in the U.S. Army, uh, had been Army Chief of Staff, um, I think in, in, uh, during the George W. Bush era, maybe a little mm. bit before, he was uh, Secretary of Veterans Affairs under President Obama. But uh, this quote 
that's you know sort of widely widely known is is he says you know if you don't like change you're going to like irrelevance even less <laughs> that's great so i think for you know everybody listening you know empathy is not a nice to have it's a gotta have mm. um we mentioned a few resources to check out to to start uh you know start reading about it start you know what what can you do to improve it and improve that muscle and and again remember it requires change and if you're not going to change you'll be irrelevant that's right love all right. it all right so bridget Andy. As always. Great to talk to you. Great to talk with you. Friends, thank you for joining us here today. It's been fabulous having you here. Hopefully this was a good use of, of your time, as we hope it is every Friday. And we'll look forward to talking to you next week. Have a great week. Bye now. And weekend. And weekend. Don't forget that. <laughs>